Good morning. We will now begin with the cruise tourism session of the 2021-15th World Ocean Forum. This will be a hybrid format with people joining us both off and online. Those of you here on the spot, please utilize your interpretation devices. Korean is channel one, English is channel two, and Japanese is channel three. Currently, we are joined via live streaming through WOF's uh, website and YouTube in the Korean and English channels. You will be also access the presentation materials on our official website, and please send in your questions uh, for the live uh, Q&A later on. Now with that, let us invite Professor Jung Sung Chol Jo of KMOU, College of Maritime Business Management, uh, to moderate the first cruise session on rebuilding Korea's cruise industry for the future. Good morning. My name is uh, Sung Chol Cho from KMOU. It is indeed a personal honor for me to be moderating uh, this important session at this auspicious occasion. Uh, we have uh, five presenters and four discussants participating in this session. Uh, we have limited time, but there is much to be covered and discussed. I believe it is an important topic and session because as you all know very well, the cruise industry before the COVID pandemic was one of the fastest growing industries in the world. The growth rate was about twice as fast as that of others for about 20 years. And in the maritime sector, the cruise industry was an exception in this sector in that there will be constant shortage of uh, manpower. That is why it is a job creating sector we need to concentrate on. So the cruise industry has been asleep hibernating for about a year and a half. We believe that we'll wake up slowly now and things will turn to normal by next year. At this important juncture, it is important to figure out the current status of the Korean cruise industry today. So at such important occasion, we are here to deal with the topic of rebuilding Korea's cruise industry for the future. It is indeed a timely topic uh, for us to collect our ideas and thoughts. So we need to reset uh, Korea's cruise industry, the parameters, and be able to implement these to drive growth in the twin pillars of the cruise and maritime industry here in Korea and beyond. We have five presenters, as mentioned, and four, four discussants. Their names and introductions will be given again as they come up for their presentations. Now, those of you here offline, if I may cordially ask you, uh, please uh, limit your presentations to 15 minutes since we don't have oceans of time on our hands. And for the discussants, we ask you to keep your comments to uh, five minutes. Apologies uh, for this limitation, but we ask for your cooperation. So we will first proceed with the presentations and move on to the discussions. And Q&A session will cover the questions that are sent in uh, via YouTube and the internet channels. So with that, let me move on to our first presenter. So the first presenter is Mr. Joel Cott, and he's going to give us the overview of the global cruise trends, especially after the COVID-19. And I believe that his presentation has a lot of implications for the resumption of uh, Korean cruise industry. So Joel Cott uh, from CLIA will give us the presentation on the future of cruise industry. So, Please. Good afternoon and greetings from all of us at CLIA. I'm pleased to be able to join you virtually at the World Ocean Forum this year and I look forward to the time when I can join you in person. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the cruise industry and the progress we are making to support a carefully managed, responsible resumption of cruising. At a time when consumer consciousness, consciousness is putting more and more focus on the cruise industry, it's important that we and our stakeholders understand the opportunities that cruise can deliver and also the facts behind some of the key issues facing our industry. While we're just a very small part of the global maritime industry, at less than 1% of global shipping, and just a blip in the global tourism numbers, at around 2% of the 1.4 billion annual international tourists before COVID, as an industry, we are taking real and important steps forward. Before I begin, let me give you a brief introduction to CLIA. Cruise Lines International Association is the largest cruise industry association in the world. Our vision is for the cruise industry to be recognized as a leader in responsible travel and the best way to experience the world. Our mission is to foster our member success and the common interests of the cruise industry by investing in research, development and education that helps guide the industry in its unwavering commitment to protect and preserve the waters on which we sail and the destinations we visit. We also mount advocacy and promotional efforts on behalf of our members to, to add and create value while demonstrating the commitment, leadership and positive impact the cruise industry has in responsible tourism. The CLEAR community includes 56 of the world's most prestigious ocean, river and speciality cruise lines representing around 95% of ocean going cruise capacity. 350 executive partners, including members of the port, destination and travel community, the maritime and technical service providers, and the product and service suppliers supporting our ship's operations. 15,000 travel agencies, including the largest travel agencies, hosts, franchises, and consortia throughout the world, and 54,000 travel agents, which includes travel agent members in North America, Europe, the United Kingdom, Asia and Australasia. The cruise industry is heavily regulated with robust, clearly enforced standards and multiple layers of regulation and policy to implement the thousands of specific requirements of global regulators. As clear members, our cruise lines are required to operate within a series of industry policies that at a minimum meet and often exceed the rest of the maritime industry. As an industry, we take our leading role globally in environmental best practice seriously, as well as maritime safety and security and public health. While we're just a very small part of the global maritime industry, we are a responsible industry. We have responsibility to the oceans, the communities that cruise ships visit, and the people who work for and with the industry. Pre-COVID, travel and tourism was one of the fastest growing sectors in the world economy. And that hunger to see the world appeared inexhaustible and is likely to come roaring back. This is wonderful for those of us in the travel and tourism business, but also a source of concern around the world for the impact on the environment that we operate in. The world around us is changing and it's changing fast. The expectations of communities around the world is that tourism has taken on much greater complexity. Our industry is often in the spotlight because our ships are incredibly visible, tangible assets when they're in the harbors around the world. As a cruise industry, we're conscious that with our growth and increased weight comes the need to act responsibly. And we are taking our social responsibilities very seriously. Prior to the pandemic, the cruise industry had become a dynamic and highly successful economic driver. Cruising supported more than 1 million jobs worldwide and contributed nearly $155 billion in global economic output in 2019. Almost 30 million people took an ocean cruise in 2019, including 3.7 million people from Asia, which had risen to become the world's third largest cruise market after North America and Europe. But with the onset of the pandemic, this key economic contributor along with most other areas of travel, came to a complete halt. This took an enormous toll on the broader travel community. 
In 2020, every 1% loss of cruises resulted in a reduction of 9,100 industry-related jobs. Every day of the suspension translated to 2,500 jobs lost worldwide, including travel industry professionals, the travel agents, the crew members, the tour operators, and all those people supporting our industry from the transport workers, the port workers, the food and beverage suppliers, and the maritime industry providers. We can all appreciate that the first two years of this decade have presented us with some of the most extraordinary challenges that we have faced in living memory. Challenges that have deeply affected our industry and our people personally and professionally. At the same time, these challenges have set in motion a global response that is redefining the way we travel now and will also redefine the way we travel in the future. This is particularly true in the cruise industry. Not only was our sector hit hard during the initial emergence of COVID, but it has also responded with some of the most comprehensive measures to be found anywhere outside the health sector. This has involved a complete door-to-door bow to stern examination of our operations, a response that covers the entirety of the cruise experience. It also extends well beyond the confines of our ships, ensuring a close engagement with governments and, co and port communities as part of a highly coordinated approach to resumption. By developing and implementing the most stringent and effective health measures we could achieve, we have paved the way for our industry's revival and developed skills in the process that will support our efforts as we face other challenges ahead. The result of our industry's enhanced health measures have been a careful and phased resumption of operations that have been both responsible and successful. Notably, Asian markets have been amongst the early pioneers in implementing the health measures and in reviving cruise operations. In Singapore and Chinese Taipei, and more recently in Hong Kong, a close collaboration was swiftly established between the health authorities, the cruise lines, and other stakeholders to support resumption. This success has proved invaluable and is now providing insight that is informing efforts in other locations in Asia and Australasia, where work with health authorities and governments towards resumption is continuing. Elsewhere, our regions our industry's new health measures have helped achieve success in other regions, including Europe and the UK, the United States and the Caribbean. In fact, close to 3 million passengers have already sailed successfully in locations where cruising has resumed. Many on board cruises that were operating with effective health protocols in place even before the widespread availability of vaccines. Currently, around 56% of global clear cruise line capacity is back in operation, and this is projected to reach around 80% by December. This translates to around 220 ocean-going ships that will have come back into service by the end of the year, which is an enormous achievement. Importantly, the experience from resumption shows that our industry's new health protocols are working successfully, and that passengers are enjoying their cruises just as much as before. But cruising's unprecedented suspension also provides an opportunity to reset and map out a future course for our industry. Throughout last year, CLIA and our cruise line members joined with some of the most respected medical experts in the world to develop and implement the new COVID-19 prevention, mitigation and response measures that are amongst the most stringent to be found anywhere in tourism. These measures not only support our foremost priority in upholding health and safety, but also create the foundation from which we can rebuild confidence amongst consumers, communities and government authorities and help restore prosperity to local, national and global economies. The measures include a combination of vaccination and testing for, for guests and crew before boarding, as well as detailed protocols covering crew quarantine, distancing, sanitation, health monitoring, and response procedures. And notably, our industry was the first globally to mandate 100% testing of all guests and crew before boarding. 
At the same time, confidence amongst travellers is increasing. Clear data shows that 85% of cruisers, so they are likely to cruise again in the near future. And that figure is back to pre-pandemic levels. In Asia, the sentiment is even stronger. Amongst Asian cruisers, 90% say they will cruise again in the next few years, which is the highest level of any region in the world. And even amongst those who've never cruised before, 78% of Asian travelers say that, that they will consider a cruise in the next few years, which is also the highest rate in the world against a global figure of 64%. These and other indicators give us every reason to be confident in our future and in the long-term resilience of the cruise market. But we still face tests and responsibilities that will require a great deal of further dedication and innovation to meet. Having reinvented our operation in response to the health crisis, we must also continue to reinvent ourselves in a range of other areas. Even while addressing the pandemic impacts, the industry has remained focused on its commitment to a sustainable future. Our industry is often in the spotlight because our ships are incredibly visible. As a cruise industry, we're conscious that with our growth and increased weight comes the need to act responsibly and we are taking our social responsibilities very seriously. Our cruise lines are making substantial progress towards environmental protection and overall sustainability. A thriving cruise industry can support the economic recovery and long-term objectives. For the global industry, sustainable seas and thriving destinations are not only an important goal, but are a business imperative. As we expect to see growth recover, we simply have to be exemplary in all our actions. CLEAR has three overarching sustainability strategies that summarize our approach to capturing the opportunity and demonstrating the responsibility, which as it happens, all end in the word ship. Leadership, stewardship, and partnership. Key to these is sustainability and our determination to be leaders in achieving genuine environmental advances. Our work in this area is ongoing and is a critical responsibility and continues steadfast despite the pandemic. CLEAR members have made a fleet-wide fleet -wide commitment to reduce the rate of their carbon emissions by 40% by 2030, and to date have invested more than $26.5 billion in ships with new technologies and cleaner fuels to reduce emissions and achieve greater efficiencies. Advances like alternative fuels, such as LNG, the technology like exhaust waste, exhaust gas cleaning systems, and initiatives like the, like the advanced wastewater treatment systems are not only making significant reductions in our own environmental footprints, but also setting standards that can be translated throughout the rest of the maritime sector. Destination stewardship is also critical and in partnership with bodies such as the UN World Tourism Organization, the World Tourism and Travel Council, and the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, CLEAR has been working with port cities to analyze issues like crowding and finding solutions. And together with our cruise lines, we continue to identify opportunities to engage with and partner with port communities to understand their needs and achieve genuine benefits that will support our mutual aims. As we move forward, we can draw enormous confidence and inspiration from what we've already overcome over the past 18 months. As we consider the future of cruising and the elements that will define its success in years to come, the answer lies in the innovation, the collaboration, and the commitment that we've already seen deployed in our pandemic response. Our task now is to continue to apply these skills across the other defining challenges that we face into the future. We have the privilege to fulfill the dreams and the aspirations of millions of people by taking them to some of the most beautiful places in the world. And we need to be able to do this in a safe, responsible and sustainable way. Thank you for your time today. And I encourage you to visit www.cruising.org to find out more about our industry and our initiatives for the future. Thank you.
예, 감사합니다. 아, 저... Yes, uh, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation from Mr. Joel Katz of CLIA. I think uh, many of us share the same thoughts uh, in the larger perspective. You know, there was a lot of uh, misconceptions surrounding the cruise industry, especially here in Korea, but compared to any other industry, we have implemented and are implementing the stringence of uh, rules and regulations to meet the challenges of COVID-19. He also talked about the mid-term, long-term, as well as short-term challenges. And I think this will pose as boundaries uh, for the resuming of a Korean cruise industry, safe, sustainable, and secure cruise industry. We hope to reduce CO2 emissions about 40%. That will be the largest common goal ahead of us. So they will present uh, the framework upon which we could build further our cruise industry. Now the next presenter is uh, Mr. Danaka Saburo, Deputy Director General of Japan Cruise Research Institute. He'll be talking about the Japanese uh, cruise industries, uh, resort strategy, and cooperation between Korea and Japan. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations on holding the 15th Korea World Ocean Forum today. And I thank you very much for your invitation to this uh, cruise session today. I am from the Minato Research Foundation, a foundation related to the Ministry of Land Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism of uh, Japan. I am the Deputy Director General of the Japan Cruise Research Institute, Saburo Tanaka. Today, since you gave me this valuable opportunity, I'd like to address you by giving you some introductions on resuming Japanese cruising under the COVID-19 pandemic. Now to begin, I'd like to talk about the dawn of cruises uh, in Japan. Now cruising in Japan uh, began in 1989. So in the three years from 1989 to 1991, seven cruise ships were built and eight cruise ships went into operation. At that time, many maritime shipping companies were booming and many shipping companies as an important part of the shipping industry have newly entered the cruise ship business. The company on the right hand side here is an owner of a cruise ship and a leaning company in Japan. A company operating cruise ships and international ferries in 1990 established the Japan Overseas Passenger Ship Association, which is a landmark establishment and a major event for the cruise industry. Next, I'd like to introduce the Japanese cruise ships uh, currently operating in Japan. 30 years, 33 years as a matter of fact, have passed since the first year of the cruise and through three cruise ships are in operation in Japan. All three ships are rather small scale uh, luxury cruise ships. Nevertheless, they have continued their business for more than three, 30 years by taking advantage of their respective strengths and their company management in the midst of COVID-19 was rather stable. 
But as coronavirus peak, the bed situation has become somewhat unstable. But I believe that the cruise business will resume and recover, and sound operation and management uh, will persist in the future. Next. I'd like to talk about the procedures involved in resuming Japanese cruising. Now, domestic cruises in Japan have resumed through the following steps. First, formulation of infectious disease response guidelines by the industry. Second, creation of a ship infectious disease response manual for shipping companies. Third, implementation of infectious disease response training by shipping companies. Fourth, acquisition of infectious disease response certification by third-party organizations. And fifth, but not least, examination at the Cruise Ship Acceptance Council at each port of call. So through these five-step procedures, the Japanese cruising business uh, has resumed. Next, I would like to introduce the chronological order in resuming the cruise business. First of all, last February of last year, there was a mass outbreak on the Diamond Princess. And come March, uh, cruise ship operations were suspended as the WHO issued or declared the onset of a pandemic. And in May, the Japan Ocean Passenger Ship Association announced the guidelines for ocean going passenger ships, including international ferries. And in September, the Japanese Cruise Ship Association announced the guidelines for the three domestic cruise companies. And in October, with the announcement of the guidelines, the Japanese uh, cruise ships resumed uh, domestic cruise business. Uh, approximately a year has passed since the cruises have resumed. But few cruises were able to operate during this pr period, and most of the cruises were suspended. Why were the cruises canceled once again after a brief resumption? Where there are two major factors. First, the spread of the pandemic in Japan has restricted the behavior and movement of people, uh, forcing us eventually uh, to cancel or suspend uh, cruise trips. The second one is that we offer cruise trip offerings while observing the rules to prevent infectious diseases, but there are few passengers who actually wanted to go on such cruises. So with uh, diminishing demand, uh, we had no choice but to cancel the cruise ship operation. Now why did the customers leave? Well, one of them is that the outbreak on the Diamond Princess did not leave people's minds, and the anxiety about cruise trips could not be dispelled. Secondly, although cruise ship operations have resumed, the ports that can be called on and the number of crew days have been limited. So the appeal of uh, cruise travel products has also diminished, which has contributed to the slump in attracting customers. Now I'd like to talk about COVID control measures that we impose on board for cruise consumption. 
First of all, cruise lines, the three major Japanese cruise lines, they focused on three principles. Number one, to prevent initial infection. Second is to avoid contamination. And third is to avoid spreading of the disease. For this, cruise travelers are required to observe the following. Number one, health check prior to and during the boarding, vaccination, and separation of passageways and aisles. Uh, we also have taken measures to prevent onboard infection with social distancing, as well as hand sanitation, mask, and ventilation. So these are the measures that we have taken. We also provide the training and education for our crew members. And we also set up the rules for her behaviors in destination. We have also come up with measures to respond if any kind of outbreak occurred. So, cruise ships were resumed with all these measures. So the cruise lines have implemented very comprehensive, meticulously devised preventive measures and finally resumed the operations. Yet still we have a long way to go before we see full-blown recovery. So in that sense, I'd like to ask for your support and understanding. Let me now talk about the prospect of the resumption of international cruise. Currently, it's still not clear whether we can see the resumption of international cruise in the future. For Japanese flagship cruise ships, around the world cruise for ASCA 2 is scheduled for next March. But it's still not clear whether we can really proceed at scheduled. And aside from ASCA 2, no outbound cruises from Japan are announced for resumption. And no one knows for sure whether the ASCA 2 around the world cruise can really be resumed next year. And also for foreign flagship cruise vessels bound for Japan, many cruise lines have established the schedules that call Japanese port after March next year, yet uncertainty lies with immigration procedure. It's still not clear how immigration and quarantine procedures will be changed and unfolded. And also, the international cruises are affected, not just by immigration measures in Japan, but by other neighboring countries, including Russia, Korea, China, and Taiwan. And therefore, it's still not clear what response measures these countries will launch. And therefore, as you can see, because there are a lot of uncertainties, it is difficult to predict when international cruises bound for Japan can resume their operations. And while we are struggling from COVID-19, I believe that we have to take a long-term view, and in this sense, I'd like to propose the idea of linking um, cruise ships for Korea and Japan. So the first proposal that I would like to make is the archipelago cruise for Korea and Japan. Korea has beautiful archipelago marine park in Jeollanam-do province, 
and Japan does have the beautiful、uh, marine park in Seto Inland Sea. Both of them have beautiful scenery, and people are struck with awe when they see amazing seascape from ships. So these are these could be very good destinations for cruise travel, and if the two local governments cooperate. And create cruise programs linking the two archipelago parks of Japan and Korea, and propose an idea to global cruise lines. I believe that this will be a phenomenal idea. So let's introduce these beautiful archipelago cruise programs and attract travelers and cruisers all around the world. Next idea that I'd like to propose is the North East Asia Cruise Program. As you can see from the slide,、um, this is the promotional leaflet of the Costa Cruise planned for resumption June last year. However, because of COVID-19, this cruise got suspended. But The cruise lines have come up with a new program that sail、um, Sokcho and Poang in Korea, Fukuoka and Maizuru and Kanazawa in Japan, and Vladivostok of Russia. So three countries for seven nights and eight days, and sailing the same routes for four consecutive times. Many people welcomed this idea. And look forward to the resumption of this cruise program. So it was very regrettable that it got cancelled at the last minute. As you know, the East Sea in from spring to autumn, it's very calm, just like lake, and therefore it provides the excellent destination for cruise travel. And we want to come up with even greater idea in the future, and introduce the beautiful seascape of Korea and Japan to cruise travelers around the world. Last but not least, I would like to talk about a exciting news that the Usan Cruise Line. That operate Aska 2 in Japan. They recently announced a plan for a new build shipbuilding, and the shipbuilder is the Maya Belfort of Germany. So the total tonnage of this new build is pretty large, whereas the number of passengers are pretty small. Meaning, it will be the vessel with great comfort, and also, this is the future-oriented, environment-friendly eco ship, mounted with the engines that can accommodate three different types of fuels. So truly, it's a future-oriented vessel、um, for the era of decarbonization. And this vessel is going to make a debut in year 2025. So far, I have talked about the resumption of cruise travels in Japan, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Let us cooperate and work together toward the renaissance of the Northeast Asia cruise. Thank you. Yes, sir.、Uh, thank you very much,、uh, Mr. Tanaka Saburo. So,、uh, talked about、uh, resuming the Japanese cruise under the COVID-19 pandemic.
apologies. Uh, we're not getting the speaker's feed into the interpretation booth. Please, uh, we ask for your patience. I think uh, the Japanese uh, situation it could offer a lot of uh, points to learn for us. And with regard to the Southeast uh, travel, it is uh, important that we cooperate and have discussions uh, with the Japanese counterpart. So it is meaningful to collaborate uh, to further revamp the cruising industry of both countries. Yes, they have made very meticulous effort in developing the cruise industry in Japan. And the presentation highlighted uh, how the different parameters and elements of the industry were linked together uh, to further develop the industry. Our next presenter is from the UK, the managing director of uh, SMC Design, Mr. Andy Ewell. We'll talk about the cruise industry's response to COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Andy Ewell. Hi, it's Andy Ewell here, Managing Director of SMC Design in London. Um, first question I'm going to look at is, how has the cruise industry responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I think it would be fair to say that the cruise industry has continued with the many new built projects that were in place before the pandemic started and these projects have continued to be built at various shipyards throughout the world. These projects have continued to be completed as well. So there are several projects completing now. Some have already completed and some will complete in the near future. So the clients, the owners will have new tonnage um, and this new tonnage will hopefully take us out of the pandemic as well. There will be a new offering from the clients, from the owners, um, for the guests. So there will be something new to be promoted coming out of the pandemic. So I think it's a very positive thing that the various owners will have new tonnage moving forward, taking us out of the pandemic. Some projects have been slightly delayed, um, but I don't see this as a great negative in any way. It's perhaps given the shipyards slightly more time to deal with things in these times which have been very different. So I think the cruise industry is trying to respond very positively. Obviously, as the cruise industry returns to cruising, um, there will be certain rules and regulations which they shall follow on board, but these have just become standard everyday activities that we all follow now in the world which is slightly different to the before the pandemic. Next question perhaps is how has SMC adapted? Well SMC as a design consultancy who is heavily involved in the cruise industry like every other co company in Britain, the country where we're based, we're based in London, but like every other country, company in Britain we had to change the way we worked. Um, we, the whole office, worked from home from March 2020 onwards and we basically, the whole company, we went home, positioned people living in the London area and elsewhere in Britain and we showed that we successfully continued servicing the variety of clients that we have within the cruise industry. Um, I have to say I was incredibly impressed how the staff of SMC Design dealt with this change in the working, our way of working. Um, the, we, we met all deadlines, um, we continued to service the clients, we met our schedules with the clients, we met our schedules with the shipyards. Um, we went from, and I think again a great positive thing is that we, we reduced the, the amount of meetings that we were obviously attending, we reduced flying, we reduced time spent away from home, we have engaged and embraced teams and similar um, video conferencing facilities 
And I think what we've done there is we've shown that there will be a great benefit in that moving forward, that we can save time. We can actually improve our quality of life um, by reducing travel time, time spent away from home. And almost we have had more meetings with clients because of the ease of the Teams meeting um, video conferencing facilities. So that has been a big positive, I think, and something that will benefit projects moving forward. Um, SMC Design have been very fortunate that we actually picked up some new, new projects during the pandemic. And these projects have been completely um, developed um, with clients and doing it using Teams um, and doing it. And, but as I say, having more weekly meetings, having more involvement with clients. And that is always a great positive when developing something as complex as a cruise vessel. So I believe that SMC has taken many positives into this and we will take many positives into the future um, to benefit the way we work. Yes, coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, which we now hopefully are doing, we have returned to the office, um, but we've returned to the office, but in a limited capacity. Um, we will have our staff will work in the office and then work a percentage of the week from home as well. And again, being based in London, this can only improve their quality of life. And we know that this flexible, flexible way of working works. We've proven it to work over the last 18 months. So moving forward, I feel that SMC has been able to adapt to the situation, adapt to it positively, and we will take great positives out of this. Do you see any long-term implications? Um, long-term implications to the cruise industry. I believe that there will be certain things that will change in how we operate on board a cruise vessel um, and they will be sensible steps moving forward um, dealing with what may be possible future pandemics. Um, but the wheel, it wasn't broken. What we have on board cruise vessels, the formulas that we have on board, um, they work. The passengers, the guests, they want to come back to cruising. Um, they're very faithful to the different companies and they want to come back to cruising. They want to come back to a world that they were familiar with and they're very passionate about and they very much enjoy. So I think that there, the implications moving forward, um, perhaps there will be subtle changes in the operations but the guests will still want to take part in everything that was previously offered to them um, it's just that there may be slight changes in how we dine how um, i think that's perhaps one of the the major things there may be slight developments in how some of the restaurants um, are operated um, but moving forward the guests will i believe expect and want the same experience they had before, because at the end of the day, it's all about the guest's experience. Uh, further long-term implications, I think it's very important that events throughout the world in connection to the cruise industry continue, start up again. You're holding this wonderful event in Korea, uh, to look at and promote the cruise industry in Korea itself. I think the more of these events that take place, um, the better for the industry as a whole. Um, we will be able to come together again. It's something that we haven't been able to do for almost the last two years. And this coming together again as an industry, this sharing of ideas, this communication between all the different elements within this industry, this is very important and very important as a step to move us out and forward from the from COVID-19 and the pandemic that we have been involved in. Thank you very much for the presentation. Andy Yuel. I would like to correct his uh, position. So he's the managing director, but in Korean term, I think I somehow misrepresented him. So because he is the managing director, he gave us a very brief overview. 
from a big picture. Um, and especially he mentioned that the people still have insatiable desire uh, for travel, uh, which is very impressive. And also he said that even during the pandemic, they continue to receive the orders from overseas and have continued operation. How? Because they successfully uh, changed the way that they operate. And I believe that this is truly a valuable lesson that we all can take. As for the cruise design, he didn't mention specific details. But one thing that he's afraid of is that the European countries are so well advanced in terms of cruise ship design. But he said that what's important is that we have to lend a serious ear to what customers say and also continue to strive to reflect what they prefer. So this is something I think that we all can learn. So, so far we had the three presentations by foreign speakers. Next, we would like to invite the domestic speaker. Huang Jinhui from KMI, and we actually have some ample time left for the session. So moving on, we will move on to the next presentation. And the next presentation is about the challenges and opportunities for the future of Korean cruise industry. And of K from KMI presentation. He's also the member of the Korea Cruise Forum. Very nice to meet you. My name is Hwang Jin Hye, and I am just a research fellow at Korea Maritime Institute. I was the chairman of the Korea Cruise Forum before, but currently I'm just a member. Today, I would like to talk about the challenges, development directions, and major policies of the Korea cruise industry. And this is the content of my presentation. So I will begin my presentation with the global and Asia cruise industry trends and what kind of tolls and sufferings we have had because of COVID-19. And then in the second chapter, I am going to touch upon the Korean cruise industry status and problems. So I would like to diagnose the current situation of the Korean cruise industry today and what are the problems that we have to overcome. And then I will move on to talk about directions and strategies for the development of the Korean cruise industry and conclusion. Here you can see the status of the global cruise industry. So in year 2020 and 2021, you can see that the number of cruise fleets in operation are reduced by 11, and the passenger capacity reduced by 7.2. And in fact, the entire number of the global travelers decreased from 24 million to 3 million. And if you look at the Asian market, Again, the 45 uh, cruises ships that were in operation got reduced, and also the number of the passenger volume decreased from 37 million to 4 million. Or rather, 3.7 million to 490,000. And here you can see the trend and outlook of the global cruise market. So the total number of the cruise travelers uh, decreased down to 5.73 million. But next year, we will see the growth. So passenger volume are expected to reach 19 million. 
beyond 2022. I believe that after year 2022, we will have the robust recovery. And I believe that a lot of uh, cruise ships will be returned to normal operation. And here you see the figures and numbers of the global cruise ship operation. So in 2019, 403 vessels were sailed, were sailing with the 600,000 cabins and 27.76 million passenger capacity. However, in year 2021, 412 are expected to return to normal operations with 22.3 million passenger capacity. And here you see the cruise ship shipbuilding trend and outlook, which will be elaborated later by Professor Chu young -yer. And if you look at the amount of order placed for global cruise shipbuilding, it's actually more than 100. And they will all be out to the market. And the average price of this ship is about $5.5 billion. So this massive amount of orders are already being placed to the shipbuilders in Europe and also the US. So the biggest um, cruise ships with the largest pox capacity is Royal Caribbean. And that slide shows the cruise tourism and cruise ship operation trend. And if you look at the passenger volumes and trends in Asia, you can see that there was some slight decrease between 2017 and 2019. But then after the COVID, you see uh, that the number of passengers um, nosedived. And if you look at the cruise ship capacity, uh, there was some increase before, but then again, it got hit hard by COVID-19. And here you can see the operating characteristics of cruise ships in Asia. So on the left-hand side, you can see the cruise line segments in Asia. So whether it's the premium, luxury, or upscale, or expedition or experience type, On the right hand side, you can see cruise ships by size. So the there are six to seven uh, mega sized ships and 20 large size ships. And also the mid size ships with 2000 uh, passenger capacity. So there are about 26 or 27. So and this slide is slightly complicated. So it indicates the destination by total calls in Asia. And you can see that the Japan ranks number one in terms of the number of calls. And Jeju Island once had the very high number of calls, but in 2020, there was only one single call. And in Japan, there are about 100 destination ports. So. In the past, Korea also had the booming cruise industry, but because of the thought and the uh, conflict with China, uh, the cruise industry um, was hit hard. And because of that, the number of calls declined significantly. And here you can see the ports by total calls in Asia. Again, the Jeju Island, it actually suffers from a massive decline and this is because because um, Korea does not have its own cruise vessels and therefore it is very vulnerable to external shock if there are no vessels calling from China then it is translated into a direct toll on the tourism in, uh, cruise industry and therefore we have to have our own cruise vessels in order to stabilize the industry and this is about the crude source markets in Asia. So 
So if you look at the Asian market, as I said earlier, so the uh, passenger capacity was maintained around 40,000. But then in year 2020, it declined significantly. So Korea, Taiwan, and other countries, they all suffered from the significant declining of the passenger numbers. But if you look at Taiwan, you can see that although Taiwan is smaller than Korea, and also it has smaller population than Korea, but still it has bigger demand of cruise tourism than Korea. And this is because of the number of port calls that they have. So this shows that compared with the other Asian countries, Korea does have relatively smaller um, cruise market, and this is because we failed to create demand for cruise industry. So now I'd like to focus on Korean situation. One of the biggest problems in the Korean market is lack of demand. So here you see the number of cruise passengers in Korea. A clear figure shows 45,000. But in reality, for the cruise travelers departing from Korea, they amount to about 22,000. In other words, compared with the total population, very small number of travelers sail in cruise in Korea. And this is the thing that survey that we conducted, and we found that we actually have huge potential demand as well as the large effective demand. However, the actual users of the cruise vessels, uh, remain, the number remain very slow. And also, so on average, about 8,500 passengers board cruise annually on weekend. And even the maximum annual passenger volume in a single year reached only 15,000. And this shows that we have failed to attract demand for cruise tourism. Again, this slide shows a um, sluggish demand in Korea. So demand in countries with smaller population than Korea to have greater demand for outbound cruise than Korea. So if you compare Korea and Taiwan and also other countries, you can see that the cruise travelers in Taiwan is 390,000 and the Malaysia 190,000, whereas Korea does have a very small number of cruise travelers. The textbook says that the cruise demand is mainly driven by the number of population and the wealth of the country, but it's not really applicable to Korea. So this one shows that the demand for a cruise is determined by frequency of cruise supply. In other words, number of calls from home port, um, that determines the demand rather than the population or consumption level. And this indicates the visits by inbound travelers to Korea. And you can see that the trend remain, is very, very unstable. So Korea was hit by third issue with China and as well as COVID-19. And this unstable pattern shows that Korea is very vulnerable and susceptible to external shock. And in 2016, most of the inbound travelers, cruise travelers, are from China. But in year 2019, the Chinese travelers represented only 1%. And because of that, the whole cruise market in Korea got reduced significantly. So this is something that we have to overcome. And this slide shows the value chain of the cruise industry. As you can see, the cruise ship building and shipbuilders and cruise ships, they are the most critical centerpieces of the industry. So the cruise ships have to be built and maintained. So there are shipbuilders and maintenance operators. And on the right hand side, there are cruise tourists. And they also create their own markets. 
So the red one indicates what Korea have has, and the yellow and white ones, these are the things that Korea does not have. And you can see that because Korea does not have any capacity in the cruise ship building, uh, so we do have some serious limitation for the growth of the cruise industry. So we don't have shipbuilders, we don't have cruise ship lines, whereas in Europe, they have everything. That's why the cruise industry is booming there. This slide is very complicated again, um, but this shows the who lead the cruise industry. So the cruise lines, as well as cruise ship builders, they are the main drivers of the cruise industry. And also there are some other partners that grow in tandem. But because Korea fails to have these key industries and we only focus on tourism, and therefore the growth pattern of the cruise industry in Korea is very, very unstable. For example, like if you look at Busan, you can see that only branch offices are there and there are no headquarters of cruise company. What about the cruise policies? So we have the cruise tourism policies, cruise shipbuilding policies, and so on. And if you look at situations in public organizations in Korea, you see that we don't really have the dedicated organization that focuses on cruise industry. And we only try to attract the cruise travelers. So regarding the cruise shipbuilding industry, Korea has no policy at all, none. And therefore, I believe that the government has to devise new measures to nurture the balanced growth of the cruise industry as a whole. And also, you can see that the, in terms of the expertise and years of experience uh, compared with the private sectors, the public officers, uh, they have to uh, build their expertise. And therefore, in order to develop the cruise industry in the future, yes, there are many, many opportunities. Especially, we have to establish the mutually beneficial ecosystem for cruise tourism, shipbuilding, and shipping. Only then, I believe, Korea can emerge as a hub of cruise industry in Northeast Asia. And for this, I think we really have to read up a lot of efforts. So the first thing that we have to do is that we have to expand demand for a cruise market. As I said earlier, compared with the Taiwan and Malaysia, Korea does have the relative smaller market for cruise. Why? It's because of the number of calls and it's because of the demand. In other words, a lot of uh, cruise vessels depart from home ports in those countries and therefore, in order to expand the demand, the way that we have to follow is that we have to increase the number of calls for domestic cruise, and we also have to provide support to attract charter cruises. And also, I believe that we have to activate the coast uh, cruise in order to create new demand. And here you can see the number of uh, passengers of coast cruise in Korea. So the Harmony and the Panstar, they operate coast cruise programs. And you can see that year, year 2012, there was a high spike in terms of the number of passengers. And this is because of the activation of the coast pro cruise program. And therefore, I believe it is very important to operate coast cruise. And for this, we have to create the favorable business conditions for cruise lines. And also, we have to offer the shipping financing, ship financing in order to support the relevant industries. Because currently, we have no financing scheme available. And also, we have to nurture the um, shipbuilders specialized in cruise ships as well as the liners specialized in cruise ships. As you know, the cruise is the industry where 
supply create demand. Uh, in other words, today's law is very relevant in the cruise industry. So the CLIA representative talked about the 1.16 million um, jobs, and all of these are actually from the cruise shipbuilding and mainly from the cruise shipbuilding and cruise line um, industry. So I think, but because Korea does not have none of them, so we really have to cultivate these industries. And also financing is critical for the growth of the cruise industry. So let's say that there is a cruise ship owner and we have to develop various financial schemes that su to support them. So like, for example, like private financing can be utilized um, as a senior loan and the public organization can participate as junior lenders. So just like the containerized vessels, you see that the private financing is offered as senior lending program so that the uh, private sectors could have the assurance um, for repayment. So the cruise lines place orders to cruise ship builders and also charter cruise vessels to the cruise operators. And in the sense, I believe it can create the industry ecosystem. And for this, again, the financing um, scheme has to be devised to support the industry growth. And cruise ship building is important for the future of cruise industry, but we cannot immediately have this industry um, because we have a long way to go. And in the sense, I believe in the interim phase, we can establish the R&D center for cruise ship building. In fact, Korea is a powerhouse when it comes to shipbuilding industry. And the main vessels that the Korean shipbuilders focus on, their new build prices are continuously declining, including the container vessels as well as the tankers and so on. And therefore, in terms of profitability, these vessels are not really uh, the right choices and attractive. So you can see that Korean shipbuilders, they are suffering from the declining profitability despite increase in the volume of orders that they take. So the actual revenues and profits decline and share prices are also suffering. Why? Because uh, they do have the structural problems and they have lost a very high value added uh, market. And in the sense, I believe that they can convert their business models to focus more on the cruise ship building. And for this, we can establish the R&D center first and then eventually cultivate the cruise ship building industry in Korea. However, the central government will not really move fast for this. So the local governments have to make a request. So it, this should be a sort of the bottom of approach. And in fact, the in Europe, we can see the redemption of the shipbuilders because of huge demand for cruise shipbuilding. And this slide talks about the strengthening of the administration system for cruise industry. So we have to establish the cruise industry policy committee as well as the cruise development council in order to build sufficient infrastructures. And also we have to develop expertise and know-how among the public officers who are in charge of cruise industry. And also various education and training programs have to be developed and provided. In fact, we have uh, these cruise training programs are almost non-existent. And therefore, the local governments and the central governments, they have to provide opportunities for uh, government officers to receive trainings on cruise, cr cruise industry. So this is the conclusion. The Ministry of Osher and Fisheries uh, came up with this press report that the cruise tourism industry lead to Korea's future economy. And I believe that the cruise industry can be a successful substitution of the shipbuilding industry that's declining in Korea because it will create a huge man in the future. And this shows how European countries have developed the cruise and the tourism industry. And uh, Italy, Germany, you see that they have a lot of jobs for cruise industry. Why? Because they do have the cruise ship builders and cruise lines, whereas other countries which have no cruise ship builders and cruise lines, uh, there you can see that the job creation is very minimal. So this indicates how important it is for Korea to have the Korea, uh, to have the cruise ship builders 
as well as the cruise lines. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Thank you for the lightning presentation. And we enjoy listening to your passionate lecture. Now, the cruise industry, the shipbuilding industry is uh, still hibernating, but the market is being realigned for sure, as with any other business and industry. But in here, Korea, we have to catch up in terms of competitiveness. He talked about ways to further hone our competitive edge. We don't have a oceans of time ahead of us uh, as the market is realigned and readjusted. It is important that we implement the policies that were suggested by uh, Dr. Huang in order to raise more funding, create R&D centers. In that sense, uh, his uh, words of advice were indeed uh, very instrumental. Now, what is for sure is that we have to shift from inbound to outbound uh, cruising. Let's talk to about uh, port of call, the the ships, the shipping companies, and shipbuilding. All three pillars have to join together to further promote the industry. He also went on to move on to details about the policy scenarios, and we highly appreciate uh, your input. I believe that is advice. Uh, I hope that his advice will eventually become the cornerstone of uh, future progress of the Korean cruise industry. Now, with those words, I'd like to move on to the last presenter of this session, Professor Yong Yeol Chu of the Institute of Advanced Transportation at Chungnam National University. He will talk about the prospects of cruise ship building in Korea. Professor Chu, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good morning. Let's, uh, I'd like to talk about the prospects of a uh, cruise ship building in Korea. Yes, as uh, Dr. Huang has mentioned, shipbuilding and cruising and shipping all have to cause prosper for the entire uh, maritime industry to further prosper. So with that, there is heavy burden on my shoulders. Well, there's the contents of my presentation. I'll begin with an introduction, an overview of the cruise industry, uh, the cruise shipbuilding industry, the passenger ships and challenges and strategies for cruise shipbuilding, and wrap up with concluding remarks. As you know, Korea ranks number one in the world in terms of uh, shipbuilding. There are some statistical gaps but in terms of the design and construction of sophisticated ships, we are indeed an undisputed number one in the shipbuilding industry around the globe. Yet, we're, we're not able to build a lot of uh, cruise ships, unfortunately. But we have worked hard on building passenger ships and honed our technology and skills in building such passenger ships over the years. Now, with uh, regard to the cruise industry, as um, Mr. Katz and Mr. Huang has mentioned, we are in the midst of great challenges at the mercy of uh, COVID-19. But I believe that the future years look optimistic because two out of three cruisers said that they're willing to cruise within a year and those who have never went on a cruise answered that 58 percent of them would likely to go on a cruise in the next few years so with the increase in cruise guests or passengers the number of uh, cruise vessels will increase and that will in turn again uh, lead to a growth in passengers enjo enjoying cruise offerings if you look at the global cruise ship building industry, you'll notice that uh, the Europeans are ahead of the pack, uh, especially their 
two twin pillars that are leading the way, Ben Contieri and Meyer Weft, and here in Korea, STX Shipbuilding is also a leader in the market. And the Shantia was acquired by Ben Contieri, and it was also acquired later on by Meyer. So the shipbuilders in European countries have been growing in size through mergers and acquisitions, and thereby increasing the capacity of the cruise ship foundation. So MV Werften of Germany and other companies in Europe who were previously working on maintenance are now working on building cruise ships. And also here in Asia, the Chinese CSSC and Japan's MHI are other names in the cruise ship building industry. Yeah, I did some analysis with the numbers on the cruise ship order book as of uh, July 2021. There weren't a lot of uh, data available for the uh, ship order book, but from what I was able to get a glimpse of, the total volume is about uh, Sixty billion dollars. That was the size of the order book. In total of ninety-nine ships, and it was uh, mainly on the books of Fincantieri or Vincentier. So these two companies, Fincantieri and Chantier, were leading the order books. Then it was followed by Meyer Werft and Meyer Turku. One notable point is uh, Fincantieri. has taken on more pro projects for shipbuilding that are to be delivered by 2027. So they have more coming on their order books, while the other companies were rather more conservative, relatively. Now this here is a cruise ship building in Northeast Asia. Now Mitsubishi of Japan. Early on in 1990, Mitsubishi has built uh, 49,000 gross-tonnage cruise ships as uh, was mentioned by Mr. Tanaka Saburo earlier. So the subsidiary of Mitsubishi will place the orders and the ships will be built. So as an initial project, they began uh, building cruise ships to launch the cruise business in Japan. And then the Carnival Princess Group also gave them orders for 216,010 uh, cruise ships, and then also 224,500 ton cruise ships. But there were cost and time overruns because of high human resource expenditures. Uh, well, this challenge has uh, led much of the Korean industry members uh, to feel somewhat pressured with regard to the difficulties in doing this job. And for China, the CSSC is building uh, cruise ships in the shipboard SWS. There's also a joint venture with uh, Carnival. So Carnival China, which is basically driven by the Chinese uh, government or in the form of a China Investment Corporation together with the CSSC and Carnival. So very actively participating as a ship owners and Fincantieri is offering the technology and the design for the ships. Now, Fincantieri is one of the companies that are reluctant in cooperating with the Korean ship builders because uh, there are virtual rivals, but I think it is uh, cooperating with the Chinese counterpart. Now, as for the Korean situation, the three major shipyards have all built passenger ships. Now, this experience is not only important for the passenger ship business itself per se, but also for the future cruise business. And of the three shipyards, uh, Samsung Heavy Industries, uh, play the lion's share, uh, followed by Daewoo and uh, Hyundai.
Okay, and recently the three major shipbuilders or sh shipyards have continued on with their business. And recently, Hyundai, Mipo, and Daewoo, Joseon are building more passenger ships slightly. In 2018, Hyundai, for example, built the large size car ferry type passenger ships, the Weidong and Sea World, and has uh, more orders on its books. And Daesun has also built uh, two ships in 2018 and 2019. Now, the R&D for cruise ships in Korea, the four shipyards all participated in this R&D endeavor until 2012 to develop the overall technology for building cruise ships. And the managing institution was a Korea Shipping and Offshore Plant Association, and I was a lead manager in this project. And since the Sewol ship incident, many presented the need to build ships here in the Korean waters. And the Koi Shippa undertook that project. And again, I was uh, the person responsible as a project manager. We undertook car ferry passenger ships. Uh, Taesun took active part, and they were able to get the order and build the passenger ships as part of this projects. So a lot of uh, research has been done to enhance the competitiveness of uh, passenger ship building. We continue to accumulate the experience and technology, and the major owners, such as uh, Carnival. I've continued to make effort to um, build the order book. We did indeed put a lot of energy into it, but not all of the orders were actually booked. Now, the cruise ship business was suspended after a tremendous bloom and the offshore plant market in 2012, as the companies felt that it would be too difficult uh, to juggle uh, both industries at the same time. So we hope that the cruise ship building business will be resumed sooner rather than later. Now, a major challenge for cruise ship, cruise ship building industry is that we lack experience, whether it's LNG or overseas plants, uh, drill ships, all of that involved very difficult uh, rocket science, practically. Uh, but by accumulating a lot of experience and technological prowess, uh, we've succeeded. But with regard to cruise ship building, uh, I think the companies and the members in the industry are somewhat wary and afraid of uh, making progress in this sector because of the lack of experience. But I'm confident uh, that the capabilities and competencies are there. And initially, we may uh, suffer financial losses and some uh, deadline delays. Those are some of the industry's major concerns. So to address a host of these concerns, so we have to hone our expertise. So we need to make more effort to overcome our challenges, especially in the area of interior design, outfitting, and design and production that are cost effective. We have uh, done a good job over the years, but I think uh, we should redouble our traction. And Korea and other countries in Asia should become our target passengers for cruise ships and take that into account in designing the cruise ships. And we could also take advantage of the K contents, the great advantage that we have as shipbuilders here in Korea to further build our technological edge. And it is important to cooperate with um, outfitter companies 
Most of them are located in Europe. So collaboration with these European parties would also be very crucial. In order to enter the cruise uh, market, uh, what are some of uh, the plans that we have? The cruise owner's relationship has been suspended, put on hold for the time being. So resuming recovery the relationship will be important down the road. And we have to demonstrate our capabilities and get a lot of orders on our books to create high quality cruise ships and commit to on-time delivery, which is actually an important strength of ours. We should highlight uh, these fortes so that we'll be able to uh, win more orders uh, from our potential customers. We have to continue on with our technological development and here locally, we should also cooperate with the shipping companies to create Korean type cruising offerings and Korean type of cruise ship building. And the Korean shipyards are number one in the world. And from a mid to long term perspective, for ongoing growth of this industry, they have to take an active part in the cruise ship building business as well. So we should harness the fortes of the shipyards, cooperate with the shipping companies so that the shipbuilders will be able to, sooner rather than later, create excellent top of the notch uh, cruise ships in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chu. I believe that he gave us a very good uh, presentation on and the potential, as well as the challenges that Korea has to overcome. And Professor Chu, today, He has shared with us all his experiences, um, and I hope that all of his dedication and efforts could be uh, translated into actual outcomes and fruits. So Korea does have the um, great shipbuilding expertise, so I believe if we can add a slight amount of efforts, then Korea, I think, will be able to um, build cruise ships. So this will conclude the presentation sessions. And because of the time constraint, we will move on to the discussion session without break. So we have four discussants. So together with the speakers, we are going to have discussion session. So we are now preparing for the stage for discussion, preparing the stage for discussion. While we are preparing for the stage, I would like to give you the story that in university, when I lecture, provide lecture on cruise industry, I once compared the price of ships that Korea won the order. In other words, the ships that are currently built in Korea and the ships that cannot be built by Korea today. And you can see that one cruise vessel equals to the price of six vessels that Korean shipbuilders build. So this indicates how lucrative cruise shipbuilding could be. So the cruise ship building is the way for Korea to have high value added industry. Now we will proceed on to the discussion session. And I would like to invite the discussant to the stage. So when your names are called, please come up to the stage. Chun Jun Cha from the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries. Please give him a big hand. Next, Yun Ju from Korea Cultural Tourism Institute. Next, Kim Chan 
Neil from STX. Former advisor of STX. So, Mr. Kim Il sung and also Nam Myung Jun from Hyundai Mipo Dockyard. We also have the seats for presenters, so please come up to the stage. So let's now have discussion session. So we do have presenters and discussions on the stage. We also have participants joining us online. I believe that there are some questions already posted on the internet. So we will. And also we have the speaker joining us online from overseas. So we'll first have the panel discussion, and then after that, we'll have the short time of the Q&A session. So each panelist, I would like to give you some time for a comment. So first, to begin with, we have Chun Jun Chol from the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries. We would like to hear from him first. As introduced, I am Chun Jun Chol from the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries, and I'm in charge of cruise industry policy. I really enjoyed all the presentations, and I actually felt uh, that the I actually learned a lot uh, regarding where Korea and tourism industry should head toward. What I'd like to talk about today is the future policy directions of the Korean government in relation with the cruise industry. As you know, domestic Korean cruise industry, especially after the THAAD um, crisis, uh, it was about to, after the THAAD crisis, there was slight signs of recovery, but because of the COVID-19, the industry got hit hard again. But the Korean government is now devising the basic plan to have the resumption of the uh, cruise operation and relaunching of the Korean indus cru cruise industry. Especially, we would like to focus on increasing inbound and strengthen outbound. As for the inbound cruise, as you know, the foreign travelers visiting Korea are mainly from China and Russia. Especially Korea is heavily reliant on China. So because of the thought crisis, the number of cruise travelers visiting Korea declined significantly. And therefore, we are now devising a way to move away from Chinese travelers. So we will explore uh, the markets in Southeast Asia. We are going to develop cruise programs that can attract travelers from Southeast Asia. 
and also as Korea's reputation is growing uh, globally. So I believe that we do have the potential demand from the worldwide markets as well. So we are establishing plan for that. And as for the inbound tourism or inbound cruise, especially under the COVID-19, uh, we have to implement the proper quarantine measures for foreign travelers so that it would not be the burden to the healthcare system of Korea. And also as for the activation of the outbound cruise program, as mentioned by many speakers, uh, we are heavily relying on foreign source markets and foreign tourists for the cruise industry. So we believe that Korea needs to strengthen our internal uh, market and domestic demand. And for this, um, you see that growing demand is not a short-term work, uh, but we are going to develop attractive cruise programs, especially centering around the East and South Sea. And we are trying to develop attractive cruise tourism tour programs so that the many people can be familiar with the cruise uh, travel. And also a lot of Korean public, they tend to perceive cruise only as a means of transportation. And therefore, we are going to develop policies so that the people can enjoy cruise itself. Cruise itself can be the theme and the of uh, tourism product. So we will develop various attractive uh, tourism programs. So again, we will focus on expanding outbound cruise. In fact, it both inbound and outbound um, in order to cultivate the solid foundation for the growth of the cruise industry. And based on that, in the future, maybe we can try developing cruise shipbuilding and also eventually to emerge as the cruise hub in Northeast Asia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chun. Uh, please give him a big hand for that. We have the presenters who have talked about some of the policies, and I think what you've mentioned, uh, Mr. Chun, are pretty much aligned with what have been heard by the presenters as well. Now, moving on to uh, Ms. Yun. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Ju Yun. I'm the research fellow at the Korea Culture and Tourism Institute. First of all, I'd like to mention that it is indeed a big pleasure to see this uh, session being held on the Korean uh, cruise industry as part of the World Ocean Forum. And that we're able to expand the discourse uh, beyond transportation to include tourism and cruising at large. And we've heard analysis on the Korean cruising industry that requires a collaboration with the shipping, cruising, and shipbuilding industries. And uh, the analysis was very well done by Mr. Huang and also by Professor Chu. And it's also talked about the policy orientations at the ministry. The big challenge you mentioned is a lack of demand here in Korea. And in order to uh, increase the demand, uh, there's a need to fill in the supply gap for the vessels, cruise vessels. Then how are we to address the demand shortage in the potential target market? How are we to convert this potential demand to actual demand? So I've been pointing this out. The potential demand is about 200 to 300,000. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, our outbound passengers was about 20 million. That includes the um, overseas customers. So even if you fill the supply gap, the potential demand has to be converted into actual demand. And as Mr. Tanaka Sabura has mentioned, uh, he talked about uh, the infectious disease prevention rules and their concerns of the passengers and uh, dampening demand. So we have to put our minds together and try to figure out effective ways to convert the potential demand to real demand. 
uh, especially with regard to outbound passengers. If you look at previous statistics and data, those people who have traveled abroad is about 23.5%, not very high as I'd expect it. So there are about 20 million people who went overseas, but those who uh, had cruise experiences, only 23%, which means not only their uh, passengers who have done cruising before that go on additional cruises. But in the future, we believe that those in their 20s and 30s are potential big clients uh, going down the road. road. And at a single vacation, they spend about 4.8 days on a cruise trip. And if you look at the Asian travelers, the average is about 4.5 days. So the real demand uh, makes it very feasible for the cruise industry to further build upon itself. And the amount of money they spend on a trip is about 1.17 million won. So there's pent demand there, the existing legacy demand. But on top of that, we have to generate new demand. And we have to do that by analyzing the outbound demand and formulate our precise strategies. And also inbound is important. And the uh, Mr. Chan from the ministry has mentioned about the Chinese market, the need to reduce our dependence on Chinese tourists. But I think we have to make a distinction here. If we do the analysis, due to the thought crisis or prior to that in 2016, the number of uh, Chinese uh, tourists was uh, 8 million. But then after that, it fell to 4 million and then in post-COVID, it increased again to 6 million. And I think uh, the vessel market, the passenger ship market is important, important. So the Chinese market, Chinese uh, tourist passengers are indeed a core target uh, for future business growth. And outside of uh, China will be Japan and Taiwan. On uh, Taiwan, we had about uh, Uh, hundreds and thousands of passengers are coming in and say likewise for Japan. So we have to diversify our target market, but the core has to be China, Japan, and Taiwan, and uh, advise differentiated or distinguished strategies to build both the inbound and outbound uh, cruise businesses. Okay, that's pretty much it on my side. Thank you. So thank you very much. So because of time constraint, um, we'll move on. So the Dr. Yoon gave us a very good overview of the Korea situation. And the in fact, the Korean travelers, they tend to prefer the short term, short term uh, travel. Now, we would like to hear from the Nam Myung Jun from Hyundai Dockyard as introduced. We are, uh, I'm not Nam Young Jun. I am Kim Chun Yu. Um, and I'm working for the Hyundai Mipo Dockyard. I believe that I am the only person who represents the shipyard, shipbuilder. So today I would like to talk about car ferry, low parks, and the cruise ships. Uh, what could be the realistic constraints that the Korean shipbuilders are facing today? Uh, but before that, I would like to talk about what kind of activities we have taken uh, for the cruise shipbuilding. So we have signed the contract for the Ropax and the car ferry, and we have built more than five cruise ships. So and also the four. Ships are in backlog, so that's about the 25,000 to 30,000 tonnage. So the coast cruise ships, I think it will be about like 20,000 ton. But the difference with our vessel is that uh, what, what we are building is the road box. In other words, we can carry not just the human passengers, but also cars. 
So for the past five years, there is a growing demand for Ropax, and this is, I think, because of the government policy, uh, the so-called the modernization fund and the ship financing program that the Korean government provides. But the ship financing program includes not just uh, include just passenger ships and no cruise ships. In other words, shipbuilders want to build the cruise ships, uh, but because there is no financing scheme available, that's why they cannot. And also, uh, there are a lot of constraints that we face while building ships, uh, because in Korea we don't have we have the shortage of the. Uh, professional designers and internal uh, equipment suppliers. In fact, the internal design and equipment, uh, they represent 50 to 70 percent of the total cost. So we have to pay a lot of money for internal equipment. Why? Because uh, all of these internal equipment are mainly imported from overseas. And therefore, even if we build cruise ships, we cannot really enjoy high profit because uh, the cost of these imported goods is too high. That's why I think that many shipbuilders in Korea are reluctant to build cruise ships. And therefore, one thing that I would like to um, ask for here today is that in order to cultivate the vessel industry, including the passenger ships and cruise vessels, uh, we need government support. Especially the government should support the and cultivate the professional designers and also nurture the internal design firms. And also if there could be the ship financing scheme being provided, then I believe that the cruise lines and the shipbuilders can have better cooperation. One last request. Our company, we have signed contracts with the Ro for Ropax. So, for example, like we signed a contract with the New Zealand vessels with the GT. 54,000 and the price is about 200 million dollars. So it's a very, very lucrative vessel, like three to five times higher profitability than the commercial merchant ships. So I think if there is a, a bit of the government support, then I believe a lot of Korean shipbuilders are motivated to build cruise ships. They do have the capacity and technology, but they are reluctant. And therefore, with the government support, I believe that we can motivate them to uh, move to the cruise ship building industry. Now, thank you a lot, Mr. Chin, and apologies. I seem to have uh, two lists here, and I committed a protocol error in uh, misnaming you. Yes, that was a very realistic assessment of the situation. Uh, the government-led uh, policy drives uh, should form the foundation, and it was a very realistic observation. Now, the last uh, panel member is uh, Mr. il Kim, a former advisor at STX Shipbuilding Company. Mr. Kim, please. Yes, good morning. My name is il Kim, as was just introduced. I was in charge of uh, ship interior Samsung Heavy Industries, and I also coordinated the architecture and at STX. I was in charge of R&D for cruise interior design. And as uh, Mr. Chandra Kim has mentioned, we're just not engaged in cruise ship building. It's not that we don't have the capabilities. So I would like to present this as a topic. Are we not doing it, or is it that we're not able to do it? In terms of a passenger ship building, there are legends uh, that abound, especially uh, Chairman Ju Young Jung of uh, Hyundai. Uh, he has uh, left with us uh, phenomenal stories about the successful business. And Hyundai has uh, laid the foundation uh, for a ship building in the passenger industry. Uh, Sex Americano was the, uh, among the first ships that were phenomenally successful. 
but the company uh, forfeited uh, future orders and had this success, this feat uh, was not continued. However, we continued to rise to the challenge in trying to build successful cruise ships. Now, Japan is indeed a leading uh, shipbuilder and entered the passenger ship building market quite early on. And as Mr. Tanaka Saburo has mentioned in his presentation, well, the details have uh, been presented, so I'll not go into details. Now, the Korea is faced with some challenges uh, with uh, garnering more orders for uh, ship buildings because of the cost uh, on competition. They're competing on price. And also, China is indeed making phenomenal growth in shipbuilding. So China is posing as a big rival, and the price for price competitiveness becoming ever intense. We've uh, built row packs very successfully, built high quality technology, and uh, Daewoo and other shipbuilders have uh, experience uh, in building 20 some row packs, uh, passenger vessels, but we don't have that kind of experience built for uh, cruise vessels. And there are some research institutes and the corporations that have carried out uh, joint research projects to develop technology and the required human resources. Uh, yet uh, cruise ships have not been built successfully, and the technology that was so strenuously and well developed are going to waste. Now, what are some of the reasons uh, behind this? Well, first of all, the shipyards here in Korea are not really passionate about getting orders for cruise ship building. And there's a low level of awareness of the cruise industry as a prosperous business. They're talking about a low technology with regard to cruise interior design and technology and whatnot, and reluctant uh, to getting orders. But I think it all originates from a corporate culture that focuses on short-term gains uh, coming from uh, shipbuilding projects. Because the shipyards are lured by astronomical uh, volume or value projects rather than the long-term investment requiring cruise ship building projects. That is why the large shipyards in Korea so far are in a rut, so to speak, and focusing on the short-term profit-oriented uh, shipbuilding practices. And especially with the interior sector, we have already advanced technology and have applied them to the passenger ships. So if you were to further elevate that to cruise ships, we believe that we could build a competent human resources and allay the concerns of the shipyards. Now, over the past half a century, we have emerged as a number one uh, shipbuilding industry here in, in the world, yet we're not able to build a single successful cruise ship, and we are on the verge of uh, giving up our first place position to Chinese uh, shipyards and shipbuilders. Now, cruise ships are not key or essential to become a leading shipbuilder, but if the valuable resources, the technology, and the manpower that have been accumulated over the years go to waste, it is indeed a sad situation. And we also need greater interest uh, in get, garnering more orders for these cruise ships. There are a lot of uh, backward policies and mindsets. We have to uh, rise over these challenges. And if we were to focus on R&D in this regard, as Mr. Huang has mentioned, we should pursue this uh, idea of creating an R&D center for Korean shipbuilding. So it is not that we are not able, competent enough to build cruise ship. We're just not doing it in order to rise up to the name as a leader in the shipbuilding industry, we have to focus on cruise ships down the road. Now, thank you very much. Uh, uh, what you have just mentioned, some very hopeful, uh, helpful note. It's not that we're not unable to do it, we're just not doing it. Uh, we have the interior technology progress that is being made, and our level is quite advanced. So that's sending a hopeful message. And I hope your policy suggestions 
uh, could be well taken in discussions for future for future policies as well. We have about 10 minutes on the clock as part of this discussion session. And joining us from abroad is uh, Mr. Joel Katz from CLIA and Mr. Danaka Saburo from Japan. Uh, they are with us live. Now, there are some questions uh, that have been sent in to us via YouTube. Are they for these people abroad or, uh, or maybe not? Well, anyway, okay, we have these uh, two gentlemen joining us live abroad, sparing valuable time. And we have uh, two people here offline, and there's also people joining online overseas. So if you have any comments or any proposals or suggestions, advice that you can give uh, for the Korean industry to further build the Korean industry, would highly appreciate your input. We would like to invite both uh, Mr. Katz and Mr. Saburo in that order. So uh, Mr. Katz, uh, can you begin, please? Do you have any questions that you'd like me to respond to? So we don't really have questions from the online participants. So are there any questions from the floor? Then I think we can entertain questions. Then let me give you the question. My question is, like you talked about the international cruise market and also how the cruises are resumed globally, but given the Korea special situation uh, and also the Asia special conditions, can you please give us some sorts of the advice uh, for the successful growth of the cruise industry? So can you answer my question? Yes, I think uh, what you have pointed out is, is very important. So um, globally, we've seen uh, more than 50% of the, of the fleet capacity back in service. Um, that's around 3 million passengers have sailed since cruises resumed. But it's also important to note that uh, um, two of the key markets, or three of the key markets, in fact, were in, were in Asia, with uh, um, uh, Taiwan um, starting up uh, first back in July last year with Dream Cruises. Um, Singapore started in November last year with uh, both Dream and Royal Caribbean. And then more recently, we've seen uh, Hong Kong um, uh, restart. And then, of course, as we heard from uh, from Tanaka-san, we've, we've had the domestic uh, restart in Japan. Um, I think the key, the key thing which all of these restarts have in common is that there has been very close cooperation between the cruise lines, between the governments, between the health authorities, and between all the stakeholders. And I think where we've seen successful restart, it's come from that open and transparent engagement between all the key parties. And where we've seen restart not move as quickly, it's where we haven't had that kind of, uh, of open and, and transparent engagement. So my advice to, to all the countries um, across Asia who are still working towards uh, a cruise restart, it's about open and transparent engagement between all the parties work with the cruise lines, work with the health authorities, understand the, 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 the protocols that the industry has, has introduced, and then customize them for the local, for the local scenario. We know that this virus is, is, is operating in different ways in different parts of the world. Different governments have different risk appetites. So it's very important that everybody works together openly and, uh, and then progress will be made. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Katz. You have a question? So, Dr. Hoang, 
There seems to be another question. Yes, I do have a question. To uh, Mr. Katz from CLIA. Prior to COVID-19, the number of cruise passengers in Asia fell somewhat. And the vessels of the global uh, shipping companies of China are now departing Asia, going to Europe and the U.S. Now, this trend, is that indicative of the global um, cruise companies uh, moving away from Asia, or is it a one-time thing? And then Chinese companies also joining the uh, pack in that, that's also very uh, worrisome. So what are uh, your assessments, what's your diagnosis and prospects for the future in this regard? Um, uh, a drop in the numbers in, in, uh, in Asia, particularly in China, uh, in the lead up to, uh, to COVID. Um, but that was, that was really being explained as, a, as a, almost an anomaly, a, a settling of the market. We saw incredible growth very, very quickly. And uh, I, I think uh, where we saw the numbers start to, to, to drop off, that was really, a, a, I suppose you could call it an adjustment or a readjustment. But certainly the long-term prospects um, and, the, and the cruise line's view of Asia is that it still has the potential to be one of the largest markets in the world. Um, obviously, uh, the, the events of the last 18 months have, uh, have made uh, you know, uh, an unprecedented uh, uh, challenge for, for everybody. And we will see in the short to medium term that the cruise lines will have to redeploy those assets to the markets where they are able to operate. Um, but I, I, my feeling is that we will see that we will see those ships come back to Asia. Um, we will see those ships come back to China. Um, and, uh, and, we will, and we will see a more gradual growth um, than, than possibly we saw pre-COVID, but it'll be a sustainable growth. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joel Cut. I, as you could have heard from him, the recent trend um, shows the slight declining, but this is just a temporary um, happening. So we have to have a positive long-term view toward the Asian market. And also for the cruise development, um, in order to cultivate the cruise industry, he emphasized the importance of having open and transparent engagement with all the stakeholders, I believe. Uh, this is a very, very practical uh, message, um, especially when we try to devise uh, policies. Now, moving on to the Mr. Tanaka. If you do have any questions, please. Um, so do you have any questions, speaker or the discussants or the audiences? Any question? So the Dr. Wang does have the question. So I'm going to ask this question. So the Tanaka, uh, very nice to meet you. As mentioned in your presentation, the 1989, the Japan announced the beginning year of the Japanese cruise industry. And since then, the Japanese cruise industry has grown leaps and bounds. Uh, so even today, the cruise uh, have been successfully resumed. and the Japanese liners and carriers, they do participate in the cruise industry. But mostly I think that the cruise industry in Japan is led by the foreign uh, cruise lines. So in that regard, uh, from the perspective of the Japanese government and Japanese cruise lines, uh, I believe that the Japanese cruise lines may expect that the government will provide support so that they can grow. But why do you think that the Japanese cruise market is led by the foreign cruise lines rather than the domestic cruise lines? And what's your response for that? Uh, 
Yes, I'm very happy to see you again. Good to see you. Yes, uh, Mr. Huang just asked a very nice question. Allow me to answer that. Yes, as I mentioned, cruising began in Japan in 1989. Many people wanted to uh, experience uh, cruising, hence the industry was launched. And over the past uh, 20 years, many Japanese people have gone on a cruise uh, for that experience. And then since 10 years ago, uh, inbound cruising products have been offered for foreign passengers. So that has been the evolution of outbound to inbound uh, tourism in the cruise industry. Now, as for the growth in cruising by the uh, ship owners in Japan, well, one of the most important elements in Japan is that the uh, three ship companies are operating one cruise ship each. But there is one challenge or issue associated with uh, this type of a cruise ship operation. Well, what is that? Well, the size of the cruise ship is small scale, too small. In operating one cruise ship, the cost of operation would also go up if the ship size is too small. And as a result, in order to board the cruise ships, the passengers would have to pay more for the services and their trips. That is why the three companies are charging a minimum 45,000 yen per person for a cruise offering. This is quite prohibitive for the average passenger to take on a cruise ship. So it would basically target the wealthy class in Japanese society. So this is uh, the dominant thinking or perception about cruising in Japan. So in order to further enlarge this market, we need to take on more passengers to create a cruising environment that is more affordable for the less wealthier people as well. But if we were to charge less compared to the uh, current level, the company would have to grow in size or enlarge the size of the cruise ships. And that effort has to be made with a lot of momentum. In order to create this business environment, we need a substantial level of investment funneled into this effort. However, this large size investment is hard to come by given the current situation. That is why in reality, it's difficult to operate a lot of vessels. And also have a lot of inbound uh, cruise ships to offer services for a broader customer base. So for now, it'll be the wealthy class basically utilizing these cruise services. So it's practically a two-tiered market here. I don't mind this two-tiered approach, the high-end and the mid-end cruise offerings. But as long as the companies cooperate to further expand the total market, uh, the approach would be fine. So this would be a durable trend going forward. Thank you. Yes, I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Danaka Saburo. Are there are any other questions? Do we have time for more? Okay, well, thank you. You've talked about the current challenges in Japan, emphasized uh, the importance of collaboration among the uh, ship companies. Now, we're running out of time on the clock, unfortunately. We have heard all of the presentations, uh, comments from the panelists during this co discussion session. I'd like to take this occasion to thank all of the five presenters, um, Mr. Katz for joining us online, Mr. Tanaka Saburo, uh, Mr. Andy Ewell, uh, Dr. Jin Hui Huang, Professor Yang Yeolju. We appreciate your excellent presentations. And the four panel members who've uh, taken part in this discussion. 
uh, Mr. Jun Chol Jun, Ms. Ju Yun, Mr. Chan Il Kim, and Mr. Il Suk Kim. Thank you all. Now, this uh, globally famous uh, discussion as part of this World Ocean Forum. We've uh, come together to seek answers on whether we're building Korea's cruise industry for the future is possible. Uh, we need to reset our mindset and industry uh, for future growth. And there's a high level of hope and optimism there. So with that, I'd like to thank our presenters and uh, discussants with a big hand of applause. Thank you very much. And those who have joined us both on and offline, uh, thank you for your patience. Your cooperation is highly appreciated. So having said that, I would like to conclude this uh, session on cruise tourism, rebuilding Korea's cruise industry for the future as part of the World Ocean Forum. Uh, thank you very much.